Oh, never mind. Okay. So, hi everyone. Welcome to the DialectsCon YouTube channel. Uh, today, I'm here with Nick, who won the DialectsCon 2021-2022 journal slash contest, whatever you call it. And firstly, I wanted to start with congratulating Nick for writing a tremendous essay on absurdism and capitalism, two very interesting topics that blended very well with each other. And before I we go on, Nick, you want to tell us about yourself? Maybe a brief Yeah, interview. sure. Um, yeah, I mean, firstly, uh, it's an honor to be here um, talking to you today. I'm also like truly grateful uh, that my writing was considered by the Dialexicon. Um, yeah, my name is Nick. I'm a rising senior. I'm from New York, um, but I attend Phillips Academy Andover. Um, yeah, a bit about myself. Uh, aside of philosophy, I'm also uh, the president of Andover's Debate Club. Um, and I like music and I like good books. Um, and I don't know, my favorite color is green. That's great. I actually do debate myself and I did debate in high school and continue oh, yeah. to this day. So that's, that's awesome to hear. A lot of people who are interested in philosophy, you see a lot of overlap between philosophy and debate for a good reason. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Uh, yeah. But on that subject of debate, what kind of, how, what did you take away from the writing process? And maybe walk us through first, you know, how you stumbled across DialectsCon, what made you want to enter the journal and just yeah. what the process was like. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I knew for a long time that um, like I, I wanted to take like a more in-depth um, sort of research writing process like involving philosophy. I mean, I've, I've taken philosophy courses in the past. I've done philosophical writing in the past, but I really wanted the opportunity to like do my own sort of research into like whatever topic I found interesting. Um, so to be quite honest, I, I searched online one day, you know, journals of high school philosophy uh, and I found the dialectic I was like, I, I read the um, the fall 2020 issue and I was like, you know, this looks like a pretty cool opportunity. Um, so I, I, I thought about it for a bit and then I, I stumbled upon this connection between philosophical absurdity and late stage capitalism when I was scrolling through my Instagram one day actually. Um, and it was this meme comparing like uh, Camus uh, myth of Sisyphus to like um, the state of like capitalist labor today. And it was just like, you know, like a joke um like not particularly nuanced or anything but I was like hey, hey like this could be like an interesting connection um and then I did some research um Thomas Nagel has um been one of my maybe not favorite but a philosopher I've been following for a while um and I read his piece on on um existential absurdity and then I found some interesting connections there and I thought it would make a good paper so I put that together and um and yeah here we are today Wow, that's awesome. I, I love the fact that you just stumbled across it on Instagram and you <laughs> like yeah, this right. idea for once. Yeah. Right. Um on the subject of philosophers that you've been following, are there any particular schools of thought in philosophy or philosophers in general that you would consider among your favorite philosophers? Mm, one of my favorites, I mean. I think my first big foray into philosophy was with classical philosophy. Yeah. Um, I'm also, um, you know, a budding classic scholar. I've been taking Latin for um, six years at this point, and I plan on taking Greek as well. Um, so my first exploration was with like Plato and Aristotle, Lucretius um, and stuff. Um, I like Lucretius because he wrote all of his philosophy in Latin poetry. Um, which I also find really cool, like the intersectionality of it all. Um, I guess from a more modern perspective, um, I really like Iris Marion Young because um, um, her her takes on on justice and um, mm. oppression and marginalization in society are really uh, interesting and powerful. And she also writes exceptionally well. Um, I think reading her writing has definitely shaped the way I write philosophy and I, how I construct my arguments as well. That's awesome. I feel like not many people these days who are interested in philosophy are interested in classical philosophy. It's kind mm -hmm. of like a, unfortunately, like mm -hmm. dying amongst like pop culture philosophy. Like people know about like Sartre and Camus, but when it comes to like thinkers like Lucretius there. So mm -hmm. it's great to hear that you're interested. And also the fact that you took Latin for so long. I, had, I was supposed to take Latin yeah. a year in high school. Uh -huh. um, yeah. Wasn't a very enjoyable process, but I definitely see the merit in taking it you kind mm -hmm. of identify like the roots of words and yeah right um i guess also similarly 
what drew you to philosophy in the first place? Was it kind of understanding its importance in modern society, or is it more you kind of happen to stumble across philosophy? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess a mix of both. Um, I think maybe at the end of the day, maybe it was like debating at the high school level that yeah. sort of like opened me up to this because if you take like for like international relationships or like politics like as far as you can go and eventually like I, I kind of discovered that yeah. like if you think about things long enough like you inevitably end up with some sort of philosophy um so I actually I, I can't pinpoint for you like the exact route like my academic journey took me but it was more like like an all roads lead to Rome sort of situation where right. I discovered a bunch of cool things and then you know stumbled upon some books and yeah here we are Nice. So debate, I think we should talk a bit about that because for me personally in my journey of discovering philosophy and growing to love philosophy, debate was a big factor as well. Mm -hmm. Just because yeah, I thrust into so I did like Canadian, I'm Canadian, so I did like Canadian parlamentary impromptu debate. So it was mm -hmm. like okay. 15 minutes of prep and then you Yeah, yeah, no, I did the same. I do American parliament. Do the same? Okay, great. Because I, I didn't know because you know Americans are like Lincoln Douglas mm -hmm. policy, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh um, man. <laughs> um, but for me, it was kind of a process of figuring out that all kinds of debates had this like common ground where you would debate about these like moral foundational ideas, like mm -hmm. what role does the state play in restricting your individual freedoms? Like right. how often do countries intervene in other countries? Is that justified? And you kind of just debate these questions. And mm -hmm. sometimes it's frustrating because it's like, it feels like a constant ping pong match where you're not really making any progress and so for me philosophy was kind of that point where I realized a lot of these ideas like a lot of the times when you have like debates in the modern age they're very mm -hmm. like surface level because you just have these yeah. cold wars where people are disagreeing about their disagreement right, right right so philosophy is kind of for me like a way of breaking that definitely yeah so yeah me as well what is kind oh, of I'm interested to hear like what your take is on philosophy yeah yeah, yeah. I mean I think I have two takes um the first of which is um I don't know if maybe maybe this is less common on the Canadian side of things I definitely feel like Canadian philosophy uh sorry Canadian debate or like the international level maybe a bit more like um you know like big world issues type stuff where because I started doing public forum debate freshman year of high school and like back then debate wasn't as like philosophical people would you know compile long briefs and reports about like statistics right. from like obscure journals and stuff but like one thing that everyone had in their speeches was just this one line right judge today we're weighing today's impacts on a utilitarian basis and I was like 13 14 years old I didn't really know what that was but everyone said that in their rounds right so I was like hey if I want to be a better debater I should start saying that and um I was you know taught the basics of what utilitarianism is I think maybe the first few times I was taught um, how to apply utilitarian framework I think I was taught wrongly because I was taught by other high school debaters and then I actually like I took an ethics class and we talked about like real utilitarianism we read like Bentham and uh, John Stuart Mill um, and I was like hey all of these people I've been debating against they kind of have no idea what utilitarianism really is um, yeah. so that that was definitely like a linkage um, to me that like if you actually take the time and study theory study philosophy um, mm -hmm you get a lot further in argumentation, but not just in like debate, right? Not just for the purpose of like winning a round or getting like points from a judge, but really like understanding things in the world. Um, and then on what you said about like a lot of modern debates just being like culture wars and stuff, I definitely see a lot of that. I think a lot of my personal friends actually joke that like debate, like competing in debate is kind of pointless because you're just like, you're arguing for mm. people like for points or whatever, right? But I think, this goes back to the classical philosophy thing, because Plato wrote in dialogues, right? Um, and I think like a dialogue is one of the purest points of, purest forms of philosophy, because I think, I mean, I don't know, I could be biased because I like Plato. Um, there's a lot of natural flow in the way that people converse with each other. And um, a lot of it is like a poric, right? You never really know what happened. Oh, okay, so, oh, okay, I'm sorry. I'm like geeking out a bit right now, oh, but good. another, big fan of Sextus Empiricus and his stuff on like skepticism where like all knowledge is really just like a all, all like reality is like a suspension of judgment right um and debate is sort of like that where you have like especially when you watch like really really high level rounds or when you're in like a really really high level round um 
Mm -hmm. Just this influx of information from two sides is initially quite confusing, aggravating even at times. But then I think there's a sort of clarity and a sort of greater truth um, that is evoked from such a process. Yeah, that's awesome. That and that the name <laughs> the name dialectcon actually comes from dialectic and then lexicon. And I was like, okay, hey, combine right. them. Sounds kind of cool. So <laughs> right, um, right, yeah. But yeah, I'm a huge fan of the dialectic process too. I think. Yeah, debate is definitely a very good way of cultivating argumentative abilities, cultivating, I mean, speech is just a very valuable skill to be able to have in this world. Um, and just thinking on a deeper level. Though I have found that in the world of competitive debate, it's oftentimes like a bubble when it comes to certain yeah, things. Definitely, oh, definitely. So one of my frustrations with debate towards the end, because I'd been debating for like years and years and then I kind of hit that point where I was like, I don't really like the fact that you have these stock arguments that people kind of reuse and right, right. it's all kind of gamified into, you have like, I know the Americans kind of call it like link turns, impact turns, and I, us Canadians don't really adopt that lingo, but just this kind of gamified, very strategic process, of like winning as opposed Definitely. to genuine i it yeah. makes me wonder like are we sacrificing a bit of that genuine like philosophical discourse mm -hmm. um, definitely yeah that's that, right yeah oh sorry if we go back to like you know cool greek wordplay for a while the name of yeah, our yeah. debate club <laughs> at school is uh the philomethian society which oh, comes okay. from philo love of and then math something learning right um oh. so like i agree i think it's the problem has gotten quite bad on the american side where a lot of debate rounds are just sort of people yelling facts and figures at each right, other, right. which is why like a sort of vision that um, my school's club has always had is to sort of like preserve this search for knowledge process while also cultivating like strong critical engagement and argumentation skills. Um, but it's definitely a challenge because like, especially seeing underclassmen now, like a lot of them are just like competitive, like they want to win, like yeah. they want to beat people <laughs> in our teams, right? right. Um, yeah. Yeah still i mean it's still a useful process i think yeah, yeah and totally. i don't know one of it's just sad kind of seeing the fact that you have like all these math olympiads and you know you have the, these like programming competition for mm -hmm. like, kids in high school and then when it comes to the philosophy side it's kind of just barren um yeah, yeah. and so that's i think debate can step in and help on that side to some degree, but then you also need other sorts of like philosophical inquiry. Yeah, uh, definitely, definitely, yeah. Yeah, uh, I guess pivoting maybe, are there specific, I don't know, because the whole initiative of this is kind of exploring philosophy through a current events perspective. So yeah, are there right. any like current events recently or in the past that have, kind of struck you as needing philosophical inquiry, like missing some mm. like philosophical thing. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people, um, recently I've gotten a lot into justice studies, um, hence right. my, you know, uh, um, Iris Marion Young, she's, she's wonderful, she's great. Um, right. Like a, a lot of systemic issues present in our society today can be maybe not explained, but analyzed or looked at from a philosophical lens. Um, a lot of like the Western takes on justice in the Western tradition don't really account for many of the you know lasting, deep layered systemic biases and problems within our society. So I think philosophy really gives us like that sort of critical angle to look at things and restructure the way we, I think, operate on like a fundamental level as a society. Right. Yeah, that's great. Um it yeah it it's also kind of difficult to define like kind of how would you define philosophy in the first place because you know when you say philosophy people typically imagine like academic philosophers but clearly that's not just the extent which exactly right right how Actually, like would you take that? yeah oh i'm sorry what was that no i was just gonna say like how what is your approach to to defining philosophy yeah yeah okay okay yeah so i feel like mm, when i was younger um you know and also growing up in like a pretty traditional asian household like right. community tends to score in philosophy right even like I, I thought all philosophy was just like yeah um, yeah 
or like, like you know like that. old white men sitting in a circle thinking about like what the purpose of life was um but uh, I agree with you I think it is incredibly hard to categorize which is like because philosophy is like so broad right two people could be philosophers one could be studying like the philosophy of the mind and also have like a degree in neuroscience and the other could be like a feminist like ethics scholar um but there's some sort of thread connecting those two pursuits mm -hmm. it, I don't know I think it's quite hard to identify what that thread is maybe it's like I don't know like a critical engagement with the human condition or something fancy like that sure. um, <laughs> but I, th I think there is a threat and maybe philosophy is it's like a like a meta level it's like searching for right, that right thread. yeah yeah that i i think that's definition that's a good definition um mm -hmm. i mean because you had philosophers who are also scientists right in the past like aristotle did a lot of yeah. stuff in terms of yeah, yeah biology and physics and so it's maybe better to consider philosophy just an art of living or an art of examining different fields yeah, yeah like, like that meta stuff I, I resonate with that right, right. um maybe we can shift into the paper a little because the paper I found really interesting I'm a big fan of absurdism a big fan of Camus and mm -hmm. I think philosophical fiction is also a really nice way to explore these ideas yeah um, do you you said you mentioned that you stumbled across this idea through Instagram, was there a particular moment where you were like, maybe describe your writing process a bit more in detail in terms of like, were you mm -hmm. brainstorming, choosing between different mm -hmm. ideas or? Okay, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I knew Nagel had an essay on the absurd. It's called the absurd, actually. I, uh, right. I knew that Camus has the myth of Sisyphus. Um, so I was like, yo, I should start with those two tags, huh? So I read, <laughs> I read okay. them and then, um, actually, I remember this like surprisingly vividly. I think I still have like the printed PDFs on my desk somewhere in my room. Um, so I sat down one night and like, I just, I read through the two. It took um, a bit. I actually, uh, I had a little argument with one of my friends at school who's also a debater uh, and she loves Camus and thinks Camus is great. I think Camus um, is a little uh, aggravating to read. Um, French, you know, existentialism is, is like that. Um, <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I, you know, I got through the Nagel, I got through the Kabu, um, and then, you know, I would identify especially pertinent aspects of the text that I could apply to, uh, my discussion of like the harms and labor inequalities right. of late stage right. capitalism. Um, yeah. And then the rest of the connections just came from like my own thoughts on the way I've observed society to work from reading the news and observing current events. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I think th throughout the writing process of this paper, I did end up like a more regular level, um, identifying events um, or statements from people that could potentially strengthen my paper. Um, yeah, and then I wrote it, uh, and then I deleted a bunch of stuff, and then I rewrote it, <laughs> and yeah, and then you know I ended up with a paper. That's very relatable. Yeah. Um, on the paper specifically, I I really liked. I think, I mean, the connection was very interesting from the beginning. And I like the way you you went about proving it. And I, I like the way I, I specifically the conclusion was very nice. The part about the mice. I thought that yeah, was I remember that part. Yeah. No, I've, I've used that mouse analogy so many times. Like you should read the yeah. essays I write for English class. They have oh, mice gosh. all over them. Yeah. Is there a specific reason or do you just No, I mean okay. I think part of this is also my English teachers fault maybe not fault but she explains a lot of this because she's really um big into like animal philosophy stuff and we had a conversation about like the mice thing once um so yeah and then i realized like yo i should like damn this would probably get me a pretty good grade in english class but that's a different story <laughs> um, <laughs> um yeah no I, I i i think it's good it's a good analogy right because um, it's sort of like, I think it's a subversion of this understanding that, you know, all human behavior is like rational and follows these concrete goals and like Nagel like sort of like looks down upon mice as these creatures that like are fundamentally unable to like self reflect. Um, but if like firstly, like if we truly live like an absurd existence, then we're not following any sort of concrete goal either right. So what makes us better than, than mice, um, at least like mice as constructed by, by Nagel. 
Um, so yeah, I guess the subversion of that while also keeping in mind um, capitalist production and stuff. Because I've always imagined mice as like scampering around and like looking for yeah. food and stuff. Yeah. Also, I guess the rat race. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I never even thought about that. Yeah. That's great. Um, but in terms of like the the paper itself, I mean, there are parts where it seems almost pessimistic because it's this idea that like capitalism is oppressive in many ways it's exploitative in many ways and can we really break out of that system but at times it's also like optimistic because it's you know even if we are sisyphus pushing that rock up only for it to fall one can imagine sisyphus happy and how do you like i guess with the absurd it's like wrangling between those two it's like this this optimism in the face of a very pessimistic world um i guess a question i have is do you think it's still possible for us to live and maybe you answer this in part in the paper but do you think it's possible for us to live within this capitalism capitalist system and still be happy even if you're a worker who's working you know 24 hours a day like yeah. seven a week just okay. in object conditions yeah yeah i mean um i think one thing i had to fundamentally wrestle with as i wrote this paper was that i was coming at this from like a position of privilege right i'm writing right, about right. The harms of late stage capitalism while like my life largely has not been affected by to any great degree by the harms of late stage capitalism yeah. um so like whatever answer i give you is is not a complete answer nor does it accurately reflect what how people actually live in the world um but if i were to you know give some semblance of an answer there's there was another motivation to this paper um besides the instagram meme which was this huh. documentary um, produced about this artist in China um, and the artist was like not professionally trained he was actually he made a living as I think um, a trash collector or like a like a recycle like street recycler type um, situation who taught himself to paint and would sell his paintings like on the internet to provide for his family and then he you know became viral so they made a documentary about him and then I watched that documentary probably I don't know, like a day or two after I saw the Instagram post and I was like, this, oh. I, I can't tell you. I don't know. If you search of like <laughs> Chinese homeless painter, you might be able to find it. Um, but watching it, I was like, this is what Camus was talking about. This was, mm. this is Sisyphus pushing up that hill, pushing the rock up the hill and finding joy in it. Um, and it, it made no sense to me at the point. But I think when I was like, obviously these understandings of like, class consciousness like anti-capitalism aren't as prevalent in China at least to my understanding but it was this sort of like um fundamental like unknowingness at like exactly what I was to make of this documentary um because I like I don't know like I didn't know if I was supposed to take that as like a model of how we can deal with like an absurd existence like ought we just to like you know work hard and like make a living for ourselves um i'm sorry i think I, I lost track of what the question is can we <laughs> can we maintain this sort of optimism i i think regardless of whether or not we can i think people inevitably will will okay that's great um and you talk about this this idea of nagel's backward step can you maybe explain that a little bit and explain mm -hmm. what significance yeah 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 um, so on the, you know, in the philosophical side, the backward step is the realization that we live in absurd existence, that there is no greater goal and that we're kind of doing these things with no greater purpose or guiding hand leading us to our actions. Um, and then applying that to a late, late stage capitalist framework, my take on it was that it's acknowledging the exploitative and manipulative practices of late stage capitalism like mm. you understand that i don't know i mean i am not well read enough in socialist theory to like accurately speak on any of these things but that like wage labor is theft or like even the understanding that like you know the minimum wage doesn't provide a living for people um the understanding that like ceo um salary is like thousands hundreds of hundreds times greater than um like their average worker um and then returning from that backward step is what results in an absurd existence when we participate in these systems while also recognizing the absurdity of it mm. 
Okay, got it. So not, not necessarily something that changes the material situation itself, but more so an awareness. Um, yes. Okay. Right. And after you reach that awareness and after you're mm. kind of like, oh, I live in a world that's, because I guess in Sisyphus, the way Camus goes about defining it is like, life is meaningless. Humans want to make meaning. There's a fundamental contradiction and that is mm -hmm. the absurdism. Um, and so like, once you realize that, what then, um, when we're in this capital system, uh, I, I think it struck me how you were, you were kind of talking about why today's workers must reconsider their relationship with capitalist production to challenge this absurd existence. So can, can you walk us through like what, what you mean by challenge and reconsider? Yeah, I mean, I think, I don't know, I think two ways. I think one, this goes back to, you know, my artist from the documentary, right? The fact that people will continue to work hard, maybe because they have to, maybe because they find joy in it. Um, but also maybe that if enough people take backward steps and if enough this is why I ended with the unionized mice bit, right? right. Um, if all the mice in the world unionize, if all the workers in America take that backward step, I don't know, maybe there is possibility for change. I mean, like you can't change the condition of your existence overnight, but you can definitely alleviate that condition. Right. Um, and like, I guess on that point, something that I liked is when you sort of nuance that we can have we can try to find ways to fix capitalism while also accepting this absurdity and while also finding joy in the system. And they don't have to be like mutually exclusive things. Right, right. Do you think like, because one of my concerns is, you know, in practice, if with if people are um, are aware or not necessarily aware, but if they find acceptance in the system that potentially might lead to sort of complacence with the system, mm -hmm. And generally speaking, when you have these like socialist revolutions involving like mass mobilizing the youth, it's based on this idea that capitalism is rotten, capitalism is bad. And so that maybe that's yeah. a little bit of pushback against the idea, but how how kind of would you wrangle? Yeah, with yeah. It? Okay. No, I, I understand. That was something that I had to work through when I was writing this paper as well. Um, I think the complacency that I mentioned um, is something that sort of has to happen. Because at least in you know America, Western Europe, other capitalist nations, you either you participate in the system or you get nothing out of it. Like I mean, sure, like the, the welfare state, or for example, or like but that's also like inextricably tied to late stage capitalism. Um, so it's I don't I I guess that adds another layer to the absurdity of it all that people have no choice but to participate in the system. So it's not like. A complacency in the fact that like yeah there's no problems with the system we're still happy despite it it's we sort of have to be in the system and while we're in the system we might as well like make the best out of it right so there's no choice and yeah and and we do whatever it's in our, our power to to try to change it um i mean regardless of if there's like material change, even just the message that you recognize your situation, you're aware of it, I think is powerful to some degree. It makes people feel like they they know more about the system they're living under. Um, mm -hmm. Is there, was there anything else about, there's obviously we could talk for like ages about capitalism and absurdism, like as separate ideas, but yeah, was there anything about else about the paper that you were, maybe some issues you were wrangling with or, like counter arguments you were, or, and just anything that, that might be mm. interesting. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, I think my paper ultimately is a pork as well. I don't think I offer any sort of concrete solution. Mm. At the end of the day, it's kind of like starts out with the status quo, goes on this philosophical tangent and sort of arrives back at the status quo, right? Um, kind of, yeah, people are dealing with late stage capitalism we kind of have to deal with late stage capitalism. Um, with, like the word limit and everything, so. Yeah, yeah, that is true. Um, but it's also like, I, it would be, it would take, you know, great work to take philosophical thought deeper, mm. further. Um, 
So, you know, maybe one day I will revisit this topic and I will solve the issue of wealth inequality and class in the world. Um, or, or, or it might not, or maybe someone else will. Um, I think, oh yeah, one other sort of cool thing that happened in this paper writing process was that I actually, I wrote maybe a half of the paper or a two thirds, I don't know, somewhere between a half and two thirds of the paper um, before I finished reading Camus. And then I read the last bit of Camus and he has a line there that I ended up including in the last third of the paper, which is, um, I, I don't know the exact, I mean, the exact quote would be French, um, but the <laughs> translation is something like uh, the the average, it, he gives the myth of Sisyphus and then he writes, like the average workman lives his life at the same condition and his life is not much better. Something along those lines. I have the, the translated quote in my paper um, and I was like, yo, Damn, Camus and I were on like the same wavelength like he he knew he knew he knew these things um I, don't know, I just thought that was cool it was like a really validating experience that like mm -hmm. I, like I was so, like I knew this connection existed and I was like you know, Camus saw that connection too so that was cool I feel like there's a point where you kind of read philosophy for a while and then you get to this point where no matter how young you are I mean obviously like toddlers probably aren't going to be doing this but like mm -hmm. you get to this point where you're able to kind of anticipate what the philosopher might say to this specific yeah. issue mm -hmm. and that's a very validating moment as you said because uh, it's definitely. almost like these are people we put on a pedestal historically speaking but who says that I can't have the same ideas as like Marx had in this right. thought right. Right. Uh, yeah. and that that's like a very empowering moment because then it's especially for young people it's I mean for me like I've always faced this block of what justifies me coming out with these ideas and having these essays written when I'm just like an 18 year old a 17 year old um and so have you faced the moment like that where you feel like mm. like as a young person you you can't really contribute to philosophy or you're you're barred from doing that and then kind of or have have you just been like whatever <laughs> yeah i mean in terms of like great contributions to the world of philosophy i think maybe i don't know yeah i definitely haven't felt the sort of pressure to like come up with like anything new or revolutionary in the world i think if anything like writing this paper and seeing like how like seeing um, how it was published um was also like validating in a way they're like yay people think my paper is cool right? <laughs> um, but it's like i don't know philosophy has I think it also depends like what you study like obviously if you're you know if you want to explore like the forefront of like ethical thought or like political theory like maybe there's pressure in that direction um but I think a lot of philosophy is just like fun to write right like you observe these things about the world and then you draw from various analyses and you apply them um yeah, I mean, I so I think at the end of the day, I found a lot of joy in, in thinking about life this way. Right. Even if you don't like produce anything that's relevant, obviously, like you know, it's high school stu students. Like even with college students, it's hard to even for like seasoned academics, it's hard to produce something that's like fully original. Um, but even if you don't, philosophy itself is a very just definitely, definitely beautiful yeah. art. Um, yeah, yeah, um, definitely like reading philosophy like there's something really special about okay maybe this goes back to like unhealthy habits unhealthy habits that i may have but i'll be up at like 2 a.m reading through like yeah know, some philosophical work i'll be like yes that i agree with this this is right um right. there's something incredibly euphoric about that experience I think. were there any particular philosophy books that stood out to you or just you know lecture series that you would recommend to other youth or yeah oh this is really funny because i had you know i've had little underclassmen in my it, to debate underclassmen at my school ask me the question <laughs> um yeah i mean the the reader i started out with was um who was this by will something the, the, the it's called this, this yes story. Will Durant, the story of philosophy wow. yeah um <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I i lost my copy somehow i don't know where it is either it's buried somewhere at home where i left in my dorm room which I'm incredibly sad about, but that was, uh, it was a gift from my dad. Um, and it was 
was my first exposure to philosophy. Actually, when you gave it to me, I put it away from a long time because I tried reading through the chapter on Plato and I was like, I don't know what this guy's talking about. Yeah. Um, I was also like nine at the time, which may oh say something gosh. about my, my father's expectations for me. <laughs> um, but I put it away for a long time and like got back into philosophy and I picked it up and was like, yo, this is like, this is smart. Um, I mean, obviously I'm also a big fan of Plato's dialogues. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, the Republic and the Symposium were good places to start um other than that i don't know i don't know you can't go wrong with that's true. i mean no you can you can go wrong with philosophy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but there's there's a bunch of wonderful starting places yeah i picked up i was in boston a while ago and i picked up uh this book oh i'm forgetting the author now as well but it's called feline philosophy and i think it, it goes back oh. to like the, yeah i think i've heard of that yeah like, yeah, yeah yeah it goes back to like the mice thing we were talking about right. before Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, Cats and the Meaning of Life. I remember right, seeing right. this book and wanting to buy it and then thinking, mm -hmm. maybe I should start with like uh, understanding Plato more before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, because I, I was, you know, I was at the philosophy section of the library and I was trying to choose between, um, no, I got, oh, no, the other one was a novel, but I was trying to pick between uh, feline philosophy and then a collection of uh, uh, rhetoric piece by Cicero um, and I was like yeah like this Cicero will probably make me like smarter but like yo this book seems more interesting <laughs> so yeah I ended up taking the cotton one yeah yeah John John Gray is a great uh, he had another book I forgot what the, the name is but it was I was recommended by a debate coach actually and I remember not liking it because I thought it was overly pessimistic but you know that's a lot of philosophy so I was, um <laughs> yeah yeah, that's great. Maybe just to wrap up, are there, you know, future aspirations, like career goals? Like, uh, what are you kind uh, of thinking? Because people who are interested in philosophy, it's just a wide range of... Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm hoping to pursue philosophy in some way in college, um, whether it's a major or a minor. Um, I think as of right now, my dream is to work in academia um, in some way. Um, yeah, I mean, other than that, I'm also, you know, um, I have activist tendencies. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that whatever I do, you know, hopefully it'll be philosophical in some form, but that I can help my community and those around me in some way. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that, I think that's good. Um, and yeah, academia is, it's like a daunting place. I, I also share <laughs> academia goals, but it's it's like a daunting idea of like being an academic at all. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And also, you know, constraining in, in many constraining ways. in many ways, yeah. That people don't real I initially never realized it was kind of glorified in my mind. And then yeah, after talking to a few academics, you kind of realize that it's not as easy or brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, still a very important role though. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so Thanks, Nick, for having this conversation. Um, and yeah. hopefully our audience enjoyed listening to a young person who's very passionate about philosophy, talking about his interests and career aspirations. Um, yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for having me. This was a very enjoyable. Conversation. No problem. This is, this is awesome. And the recording. Yeah.